everyone. It's wonderful to be here together and to be able to worship uh, our great God together. Why don't you stand uh, and join with us as we do that? Steadfast love who can escape your faithfulness in endless sea, so full of grace and mercy, we sing God is so good, and God is so It's 
grateful to be here. We are so grateful to be in your presence, in the presence of a loving God who is so, so good. And God, as we think on who you are, and we think on what you call us to, which is to surrender our lives in worship, God, we say not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name be the glory for your love and your faithfulness to us. God, we worship you this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. 
Ah, oh, thanks. I love it when I get a good morning back. It's uh, it's beautiful. It's so great to be with you this morning. I've been on holidays, so I feel so refreshed and I've had a slow down summer. It's been great, but I'm so excited to be back. I love this church community and I'm so just grateful for what God is doing in our community in and through us. So I'm excited to be here. I hope you're excited to be here this morning. I hope if you're watching online, you're excited to be doing church in your pyjamas and having a hot cup of tea while you do it. Um, I just wanted to remind you this morning that seven at seven, oh wait, we're going to do offering. I forgot, I need to have my piece of paper in front of me. <laughs> we give our finances and it, as an extension of our worship to God because we recognise that everything that has been given to us has been given to us because of God's goodness and his graciousness and his faithfulness to us. And so we choose as a, as a group of members and a community, we choose to give back to God through our finances. And so if you do that, you can do that this morning, either through uh, online following the prompts, or if you like to give cash, you can do that at the back. And uh, why don't we pray for that? Father, I thank you so much that you are an incredibly generous God. Father, we thank you that you have given so much to us and we have hearts full of gratitude for the way that you continuously provide for us. And Father, this morning we bring before you our little bit our little bit of finance that you have gifted us and we pray that you would multiply it for your kingdom. We pray that it would be put to good use, that people would be fed and loved and supported in this community and in the surrounding areas because of the generosity of your people. Father, we pray that what we invest in your kingdom now would bear good fruit into eternity. And so we give it to you this morning with a grateful heart, knowing that you are the author of all of our provision. In your mighty and wonderful name, amen. Seven at Seven is back. <laughs> I'm just so excited about Seven at Seven. If you have never done Seven at Seven, I can assure you that once you get around the Zoom technology, which can be a little bit tricky, it is an amazing seven minutes that we spend with each other every morning, every weekday morning, partnering with uh, Broadview Baptist and we just spend seven minutes bringing before God people in our lives who we are believing that God would transform through salvation. And what I love about seven at seven is that it's it's the start of my day. And so it's sort of like the filter by which the rest of my day is filtered through. And as I engage in conversations with people, I'm remembering that there is a God that is for them, that there is a God who deeply wants to have relationship with them. And it shapes the way that I engage with people over the course of my day. And so I would love to invite you again. If you have never done it, it's not too late. If you think the technology is really tricky, come and chat with me or with one of our young whippersnappers who, you know, technology is easy peas for them. Uh, what a great intergenerational conversation that would be. How do I use Zoom? Uh, but I really would encourage you, if, if Zoom is too hard for you, why don't you just set your timer for seven o'clock and, um, and, and be joining us in prayer. You don't have to be on a screen to pray at seven for seven minutes with us, but I would encourage you, it, it really is an awesome opportunity. Um, we are advertising Pathfinders this morning, so I need the slide. My, when I watch, if I ever watch the videos back, I am constantly doing this to the screen at the back, which means I need to get glasses. All right, so Pathfinders planning dinner is Saturday the 11th of Feb and it's at 6 p.m. $5 here at Enfield Baptist Church. And if you could see John Chapman or Brian, uh, can you give us a wave if you're here? There's John, is Brian here? Their wives. <laughs> 
Yeah, all the women say, we know, we know. All right, so go and see them and uh, let them know that you're coming. Do you need them to RSVP? Yes, for catering, I imagine. So get around it. Uh, I want to take this opportunity to pray for our educators. Uh, I know that some of our teachers have already gone back to school last week or for some of you even earlier than that. Uh, But who knows that we have a lot of teachers in this church, like a crazy amount of teachers in this church. And I don't think that that's a coincidence because I think that it's incredible that the people of this church get to go out into the community and represent Jesus and his love to kids in schools who so desperately need to know what Jesus with skin on looks like. And so if you are an educator in this space, and I don't just mean a teacher, I mean if you work in a school, if you facilitate education, I would love for you to stand right now. Damien's favourite, you can start, can be the first. Great. There's more of you. Yes, there's a lot of you. Beautiful. If somebody that is an educator is sitting in your row and you know they're not standing, just give them a little cheeky. Uh, All right. Now, I would love if we could get around these people. So if you want to stand uh, and go and find somebody to just lay hand on as we pray for them for this new school year, let's make sure Sam's at the back that nobody doesn't have someone around them. Dan and Rachel. I'll wait. (laughs) Oh yeah, home educators, thank you. Come pray for me. I need all the prayer I can get. Okay. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the young lives that matter infinitely to you. Father, we thank you that you have charged us with the care of young people. And so, Father, at the beginning of 2023, we, uh, we commit ourselves afresh to being you in our schools. Father, for each of these teachers, I pray that you would fill them with your spirit and with your anointing, that it would be your power that goes with them into the classrooms. Father, that they would carry your peace that passes understanding. Father, that they would represent you to a world that is confusing for a lot of our young people. Father, we pray that they would find in these teachers safe hands, people that they can share their confusion and their anxiety with, people that they know love them and are praying for them and are championing them. Father, we pray for the rest of the congregation that you would help us to support and love the educators in this community. Father, give us ways to bless them and to come alongside them as we as a church uh, help to change the life of young people. Father, we commit ourselves to you in 2023. Would you have your way? Would your kingdom come and would your will be done? In your mighty and wonderful name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You can take a seat. You can go and uh, chat with those people during coffee after the service and find out how their first week was. They probably all have done week zero if they haven't been in a classroom with students. So encourage them, get alongside them. It's exhausting being a teacher, but it is incredible work. Uh, I'm going to welcome Katie to the stage to read the scripture for us this morning. Uh, Good morning, everyone. My name's Katie, so I'm just going to be reciting Psalm 23. Um, The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest in green meadows and leads me beside peaceful streams. He renews my strength and guides me along right paths, bringing honour to his name. Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I'll not be afraid, for you are close beside me. Your rod and your staff protect and comfort me. You're not, you honour me by anointing my head with oil. My cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life. And I will live in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. 
I don't need it now. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Katie, for reciting that so beautifully. So I asked Katie to recite that, and she took up the challenge. So I challenge you all to, if you haven't already, learn that psalm off by heart. We've heard it uh, often enough, I'm sure. Good morning. Hello, church fam. Um, hello to those online. Don't want to forget about you. Um, my name is Kira. Um, for those of you who haven't met me, um, hopefully I've met most of you by now. I've been here about two and a half years, so if not, come and say hi. I'd love to meet you. Um, so this journey with God in preparing for this morning has been quite interesting. I was wondering how I was going to share about this last part of Psalm 23, and I thought maybe I'll just kind of dust off the theology textbooks. There's always something good in there. Um, but as I prayed over this space, the Holy Spirit really just impressed on me uh, that this time was going to be about her heart of love. So God's heart of love. And that's what I'm sharing about this morning. Um, so I'm really excited to see what the Spirit will do. Uh, so we're going to start with prayer. Holy Spirit, Give us fresh revelations of your love today. Speak your mind and your heart through me and hide me behind the cross as I speak. Whatever has our attention this morning apart from you, help us lay it down. Help us be fully present in this moment to what you want to do. Because what you do is always good and always loving. Amen. So as we've been journeying through this psalm, I've come to realize that David has some pretty bold convictions. And the verse I'm going to be talking about this morning is no different. So David starts by saying, I hope this is going to work. There we go. Surely goodness and love shall follow me all the days of my life. I think we can read this first part, or at least I can, and think, that's nice for David. Or how can he be so confident of this? Or even, what is he doing that I'm missing here? Because there will be days for every single one of us where it may not feel like or even look like goodness and love follows us. Days where we can only connect to this psalm on a cognitive level, and maybe days where we can't even do that. This morning, I'm going to look at a few reasons why this might be, and I'm going to invite you to consider fresh possibilities about God as I do. Maybe in preparation for this, in the privacy of your own heart, you might ask, what is it that you want me to know today, God? So the first reason we're going to look at is that experiences of harm shape how we see God. Joel spoke about dark valleys a couple of weeks ago. These experiences of pain and heartache may cause us to feel that something as wonderful as Jesus' love couldn't possibly follow us. We instead see the world through our own trauma lens, and this can actually give us a picture of God that is distorted. I think this is particularly common if we've been through relational harm because we're meant to see God in people as we've been made in God's image. We often experience our relationship with God through our relationship with others. Perhaps you're in a space today where God seems cold or unkind or even cruel. This is a very real possibility and it's something that needs to be talked about. Because if it's not spoken about, we might become burdened by a layer of shame for even thinking about God in this way, or we may become bitter towards God and feel trapped in a prison of resentment. Either way, we won't feel we can trust him with our deepest wounds. If any of this resonates with you, I want you to know that we as the church hurt with you. And this might sound extreme, but I'm completely serious. 1 Corinthians 12.26 says that when one member of the body suffers, all members suffer with it. So I invite you to talk with one of our beautiful pastors here at Enfield, maybe even see a counsellor over at Life Design, or Life Well. 
Now, if your wounds have come from the church, I want to acknowledge this, if your wounds have come from other Christians, then I am deeply sorry. And I encourage you again, talk to someone about this. Because whatever the harm, whoever it may have come from, God has time for our healing. The second reason we might not feel we can connect to David's words is not knowing what's accessible to us. So take the example of a life jacket. Imagine if all aircrafts were fitted with these, as they obviously are, but no one ever did the safety briefing or even mentions to you that there are life jackets available for use. Bit ineffective, right? We need to know that it's there and how to use it properly for safety, for peace of mind, to be well prepared for the flight. How much more important is it for us to know what we have access to when it comes to eternal things? Well, I think the only place that would make sense to look for an answer is the Bible, God's eternal word to us. In Hebrews 4, we are told that since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. So there it is. We, as children of God, have access to the throne of grace because of Jesus just let that sink in for a moment. We get to walk into God's throne room with confidence, trusting the fact that we are welcome to approach. No one can tell us otherwise. And once there, we can speak to God in confidence. I tried to find a picture of a throne room for this point. Um, but between pictures of interesting interpretations of the book of Revelation and pictures of the throne room we all visit on a daily basis, you catch my drift. <laughs> yeah, Google was giving all the options at this point. Um, I, chose, I chose this one because this is what approaching the throne of God is, prayer. It includes the process of lamenting. Because wrestling with God about what's happening keeps our hearts honest before him. It includes thanksgiving, because an expression of gratitude for who God is or what he's done helps us keep our hearts open to hear from the Spirit. And it also includes petition, because making our request known to God and leaving it with him strengthens our trust in God. So the final reason we may not resonate with this part of the psalm is because the spiritual realm of darkness is always working against the goodness of God. Now this point can make some people maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but if we believe the rest of scripture, then we have to address this biblical truth too. Ephesians 6 says, we don't fight against flesh and blood but against the rulers, authorities, powers, and spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Satan is always wanting to thwart God's beauty. Dan Allender, who's a Christian psychologist and author, said in one of his podcasts, I think evil targets that which most reveals the kingdom of God. That is to say, Humans are targeted more than anything else in all creation because we are image bearers of God, revealing something of his glory. Whoa. <laughs> so what do we do with this? Again, the Bible gives a pretty clear answer. Ephesians 6 goes on to say, put on every piece of God's armor so you will be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. It goes on to describe the spiritual armor and finishes by saying, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So you see, it's an active, not a passive battle to stand against the lies of Satan, but perhaps not active in the way you might think. Uh, we don't have to learn Kung Fu moves or be able to use mind control on evil. No, the most important thing in this battle is to know scripture. 
really. Even Jesus used scripture to take a stand against Satan's lies. If we get into scripture, we can know God's truth about reality and recognize when something contradicts it. So now let's move into the second part of this verse. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So David anticipated with the same conviction that at the end of his life, he would enter heaven, the house of the Lord, and live there forever. We have that same hope as fellow children of God. Ephesians 1.14 says that the Holy Spirit within us is a deposit guaranteeing this. So what does it look like in our present day? Well, the, shepherds, the blessings sorry, of being shepherded by God are directly related to being in God's presence. Goodness and love aren't just definitions of God. God defines these terms. What is goodness? God. What is love? God. God is giving himself when it says goodness and love will follow you all the days of your life. I know we've talked about us as sheep following the shepherd, but what happens when a sheep is lost? Matthew 18, 12 says, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes after the lost sheep. God pursues us. And it doesn't stop after we become Christians either and receive the Holy Spirit. It is a never ending pursuit of us because Jesus longs to be with us. One of my beautiful supervisors, Noni Potter, writes this in her book, Living Your Best Life. Quote, the battle for intimacy is nothing to do with God withholding himself. It is about the pressure which comes from the many good things filling our time and keeping us in shallow experience and relationship with God instead of moving into the deep relationship he desires with us. This is about us deciding whether or not to abide with Jesus, to remain in interaction with God. God is not someone we simply visit if we really want to know him as our shepherd. We need to keep company with God. Charles Spurgeon says this, while I am here, I will be a child at home with my God. The whole world shall be his house to me. And when I ascend into the upper chamber, I shall not change my company, nor even change the house. I shall only go to dwell in the upper story of the house of the Lord forever. So where are we dwelling? Is it with Jesus or is it somewhere else? Are we abiding in a space of worry about the future? A space of trying to control the people or situations around us? A space of hurry and joylessness. I'm preaching to myself right now. <laughs> Just to clarify, it's human to feel the emotions of fear, worry, and anxiety. Let's not condemn that. But are we choosing to abide in them, to dwell there? Because we aren't powerless to our internal world. Because God has given us a spirit of love, power, and self-discipline. We have the option each day to choose where we will dwell. And the thing is, we will choose something whether we like it or not. It starts with where we are directing our mind. I work as a psychotherapist and let me tell you, the space between your ears will be filled with something based on where your focus is. It's the way our brain works. It's like an athlete preparing for the Olympics. They're going to be training, reading, talking, watching, everything to do with their sport. What do you think the majority of their thoughts are going to be about? Their sport. Yeah, exactly. The automatic thoughts that come in, that just appear in the brain, are the majority of the time going to be ones that have been influenced by what you have intentionally chosen to fill your mind with. That is why the Bible says in Romans 12 too, that we need to renew our minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus knows that what we direct our attention to, where we let our minds stay and camp out, is going to deeply affect us. And what's even more interesting is that in the verse prior, Romans 12, 1, it says that God actually wants all of us 
not just our minds. He actually wants our whole being, our minds, bodies and souls to dwell with him, a full embodied experience. So let's enjoy it. Let's not skimp on our time with Jesus. Let's be people who would trade the world for a day in his courts, who would say with David in Psalm 27, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his holy temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. We can only experience the fullness of the love of God if we open ourselves up to relationship with him. Henry Nouwen, oh, such goodness, get on board. Henry Nouwen, a Dutch priest and theologian, writes this. When God has become our shepherd, our refuge, our fortress, then we can reach out to him in the midst of a broken world and feel at home while still on the way. When God dwells in us, we can enter into a wordless dialogue with him while still waiting on the day that he will lead us into the house where he has prepared a place for us. Then we can wait while we have already arrived and ask while we have already received. Okay, last analogy before we finish. This was just too cool to leave out. So I was trying to think of something that encapsulated this idea of being deeply rooted in Jesus. I had the idea of tree roots. I know how original. But out of curiosity, I googled, what tree has the deepest roots? And I kid you not, this came up. Wait for it. Okay. If you can read that. Right? Make of that what you will, but it's pretty cool. Shepherd's tree. <laughs> the deep affections of the heart of God can only touch our hearts after we accept his promise of love and reach out to receive it by faith. Simply put, we need to take God at his word. And then as we enter into his offer of love and accept the truth of his heart, we will overflow with his love back to him and out to others. Let's pray. Oh God, give us a full revelation of your goodness and love. Help us to dwell and abide in your presence every moment of every day. Lord, you promise never to leave us or forsake us. Thank you that we can repeat that promise with conviction when we feel otherwise. God, in the hardest moments, help us run to you and not away from you. For you are the good shepherd who laid down his life for us. We love you, Lord, because you first loved us. Amen. As this next song um, starts, I'm just going to invite you to remain seated and just linger in this space and spend some time of reflection with God. You know, maybe you, you'll kneel, maybe you'll raise your, your hands. Maybe you can ask again, you know, God, what is it that you want me to know about yourself today? Maybe the Spirit's already laid something on your heart. So I encourage you to just lean into that as we worship now. Thanks, guys.
This morning we have the opportunity to come around the communion table. And I wanna acknowledge this morning that we live in a complex world. We do live in a world where sin and darkness exists, right? We do live in a world where there is sorrow and suffering, where there is trauma. There's dark valleys. There's a tension because we know that the goodness of God exists for us. We know that our cup overflows and yet we live in a complex world. This morning I I put tissue boxes at the front of the stage because I sensed this morning that we might need to do some processing with Jesus at the end of this psalm. Because our good shepherd, he knows the heart of his flock this morning. And he knows that some of us have heavy hearts today. Because some of us are battling with sickness that seems unfair. Some of us are battling with addictions that we just feel like we cannot break. Some of us feel like the valley of the shadow of death is a valley that we might never get through. Some of us have been hurt by the church. Little C church. We come with our realities this morning. But as I've been thinking about this psalm over the past few weeks, I've been thinking about how this psalms was the prayer book of Jesus. That Jesus prayed this psalm as he sat at the communion table with the disciples, with a disciple who he knew was going to betray him. He knew that he was about to go through the, the, the death. He was going to go through that valley. And yet he says, surely your goodness and your mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me read this Psalm to you again as we consider Jesus at the table. Jesus knowing what it would take to deliver us from evil. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in green meadows. He leads me beside peaceful streams and He renews my strength. Would you renew our strength today, Jesus? He guides me along right paths, bringing honour to His name. And even when I walk through the valley, dark valley of death, I will not be afraid. For you, God, are close beside me. Your rod and your staff, they will protect me. They will comfort me. You prepare a feast for me in the presence of my enemies and you welcome me as a guest at your table, at your communion table today. Anointing my head, not with sorrow, not with suffering, but with oil of blessing. 
my cup overflows with blessings. Surely your goodness and unfailing love will pursue me all the days of my life and I will live in the house, not of this world, not of the brokenness of this world, not in the brokenness of sin, but I will live in the house of the Lord forever, for eternity. Amen. I agree. Let it be so. And so this morning, we are going to partake in the emblem and whatever it is that you need this morning, would you bring it before God in prayer? As we declare the goodness the loyal love of our unfailing God through the ages. And if you need to cry this morning, cry. If you need to kneel this morning and say, God, realign my heart today, then do it. Because the presence of the Most High dwells within us. Would you eat and would you drink this morning? Father, we thank you that we come boldly into your throne room today as children of the Most High God. And we acknowledge our sadness. We acknowledge our our sorrow, but we hold it against a God who is good a God who is eternal, a God who was the same yesterday, today and forever. Surely, surely your goodness and your mercy will follow us. Thank you for the act of Christ on the cross that has made this possible for us today. Would we see you afresh today? Would we put you in your rightful place afresh today that the things of this world would fall away as we declare that whatever may come, it is indeed well with our souls. Would you stand this morning? And would you sing this song with me as a declaration, even when we don't feel like it, that we can declare that God is good and that it is well. It is well with our soul. But Lord, it's for for thy God.
you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to dwell in your word and to dwell here with your spirit and with your family. And God, we pray as we go from here, may you bless our conversations, may you lead them into deeper places, we pray, that we might experience your love and your mercy and your grace and your peace as we do that. So God, we pray for your blessing on this church, family, this community. In your name we pray. Amen.